St. Augustine prayed, Command what thou wilt, O Lord, but give what thou commands. Pope Clement XI prayed, Lord, I desire that in all things thy will may be done, because it is thy will, and in the manner that thou willest. St. Joan of Arc embodied these words in her whole life. Born on the Epiphany in 1412, as a shepherdess, she entered a sort of novitiate with St. Michael the Archangel around 13 years of age in 1425. After three years under his angelic care, he compelled her to leave her home and her family to save France from English rule and the Hundred Years' War. And God gave her what he commanded. He gave her angelic purity. He gave her angelic guides and saintly voices of St. Margaret and St. Catherine. He gave her a pure heart and a and a lucid mind, a clear mind. England had its Agincourt. Joan would reverse all their gains and mortally wound the Hundred Year War, Hundred Years' War at Pate. She would see her king crowned at Rheims. France could have ended the war in months under her guidance. Everything would have been over, and they'd have been on their way to fight the Saracens and imagine what Joan would have done to them had they only listened to her. The somewhat cynical Mark Twain confessed toward the end of his life after writing all his books, I like Joan of Arc best of all my books, and it is the best. I know it perfectly well. And besides, it furnished me seven times the pleasure afforded me by any of the others. Twelve years of preparation, two years of writing, The others needed no preparation and got none. Now keep in mind that Joan of Arc, an historical novel by Mark Twain, was the last of his novels. And he wrote it at a time when he was anti-Catholic and against France. There is something special, therefore, about Joan of Arc that affected even the pessimistic Twain. He's not the only one. Interest in her was greatly increased after the French Revolution. Why so? Because Joan mysteriously embodied the solution to the problems at hand. The church had just been suppressed in France. As it were, they tried to guillotine her. And this revolution was spreading. Not surprisingly, Voltaire hated the virginal Joan. And many moderns have tried to dismiss her or hijack her and use her for their own ends. But the real Joan will not go away easily. Across the board, she is among the most written about saints in history. Hundreds of books, plays, and movies exist on her in many languages. The reason for this is found in a very touching and perhaps autobiographical scene in Twain's book. It takes place after Joan pardons from the death sentence a soldier named the Dwarf. This Dwarf had left God's army without permission. He was AWOL. He had lost all he held dear in the world. He only came back to be put to death, having despaired of life. Joan looked at him, heard his story, and said to him, You shall live. You shall serve France. He responded, I will serve you. You shall fight for France. I will fight for you. You shall be France's soldier. I will be your soldier. You shall give all your heart to France. I will give all my heart to you and all my soul and all my strength, which is great. For I was dead and I'm alive again. I had nothing to live for, but now I have. You are France for me. You are my France, and I will have no other. From this scene, Twain hits upon an important reality. Joan, the maid of Orléans, represents something much bigger and marvelous than herself. Twain sensed this, but without faith, he could not grasp the mystery. He rightly fell in love with Joan, 
and considered her the best of all human persons who had ever lived, claiming her to be, quote, the most innocent, the most lovely, the most adorable child the ages have produced, end quote. What he failed to grasp, however, is this. Joan is a type, an exemplar of the church. Joan embodied in herself and her short life many aspects of Holy Mother Church. Although we may at first be taken aback by Twain's singular love for Joan, we realize that what he said makes perfect sense when we realize what he really loved was the church Joan represented so well, so perfectly. And this church, this mystical body of Christ, cannot be loved too much, for she is infinitely lovable, perfect, and spotless. This typology, then, is an easy way to see the whole life of Joan of Arc as the type of the church and grasp its deeper meaning. Let's go through a couple points, then. Joan was virginal and very pure, loving purity in itself and in others. In fact, one man claimed that he was betrothed to her, that she was betrothed to him. But the claim did not stand up in court when Joan would not go along with it. They went to an ecclesiastical court, and she remained a virgin, and he had to pack up. Although she was fully armed and could handle a lance better than many of her soldiers, proven to be so, the only time she ever used a sword was to break it over the back of a woman camp follower of ill repute. Joan was known to be very gentle and persuasive with these women, encouraging them to either marry a soldier or to leave. But this one was stubborn and refused to obey. She also was known to sleep in her armor when in, on the field. What is more, several accounts of the men who worked alongside Joan testified that she inspired purity in them. Listen to the testimony of the knight Jean de Metz, who was the first to swear allegiance spontaneously to Joan. This knight said, She inspired me with such respect that for nothing in the world would I have dared to molest her. Also, never did I feel towards her, and I say it on oath, any carnal desire. Her words and ardent faith in God inflamed me. He noted how that as he was with her on her first trip to Chinon, There were only a couple of them. He said as he approached her or was around her, his passions literally died down and disappeared. She could not be touched in that way. Even though the rough and crude English guards tried to assail her purity at times, they always failed. She remained inviolate to the end, dying a pure virgin. The church is ever pure and virginal and loves this virtue. In a mystical vision of the church, blessed Francis Palau, he said, I saw her beauty, always young, always virgin, all perfection without stain or wrinkle, infinitely lovable. The church spoke back to Palau, the more you look at me, the more you will love me, and the more you love me, the more pure and chaste you will be. Second of all, she was trained in the novitiate of St. Michael, the archangel, for over three years. This great archangel has always been considered the guardian angel and protector of the Catholic Church. He is her general. He is her champion and defender. How fitting it was that the one who first came to Joan, who herself was destined to be a near-perfect type and exemplar of the church, St. Michael, Apart from her family, St. Joan learned the faith through this heavenly guide, as well as the virgin martyrs St. Catherine and St. Margaret. As the little virgin soldier of Christ carried out her duties, it became clear that she needed no human counsel, no spiritual directors or guides. At times, Joan clearly showed she possessed infused knowledge and gave her that gave her what most men long experienced in life, and warfare did not possess. All things considered, 
She is the greatest general in the history of the world. Teenaged girl general. Perfect execution of all military works. Again, she would have conquered the Hundred Years' War in a couple months if they'd listened to her. How foolish they were. But God had other things in mind. She answered the secret requests of the king. When Joan was put on trial two times, once at Chinon and once at Poitiers, at the command of the French crown prince Charles VII, it proved her godliness. And later, by the English, an attempt to prove she was of the devil. Both times, her answers to questions were clear. They were concise. They were fearless, causing many to marvel. Her memory proved accurate and precise. She did not repeat herself. She says, look at the record. I spoke on that already. Even after many days had passed, even though they tried many tactics to confuse her and trip her up, they all failed. They mistreated her, posted a constant guard on her, kept her from the sacraments for months on end, starved her in some ways. Here we see typified in Joan how the church cannot be deceived, nor forced to do something evil. She is enlightened and sustained by heaven itself, requiring no earthly guides or counselors. She has all the right answers. She doesn't need anybody else. Outside, She has the Holy Ghost for her soul. We consult her, not she, us. Neither does she change her teaching. Her memory is perfect. She says, look back. I have spoken on that already. The virginal Joan rose up young and brought forth a king, an echo of the Blessed Virgin bringing forth the King of Kings. She was born at Domremy in Lorraine. Domremy takes its name from the Saint Remigius, Domremy, and for short, which is the parish church of the town where Joan was baptized. Lorraine was held as the French, as a sort of Nazareth, had been to the Hebrews and Judea to the Romans. They could not imagine anything good coming from that remote borderland. Yet from thence came the Savior of France. St. Remigius baptized the first king, Clovis, at the font in the cathedral at Reims, first Catholic king, making France the eldest daughter of the church. And so Joan from Domremy led the king there at Reims to be crowned, as had all the French kings, to preserve the faith of France. How fitting is God's design. Joan was a soldier, symbolizing the militant nature of the church on earth, she reversed the fortunes of the Hundred Years' War by the crowning of the king in a short two months. This is a, she accomplished first and foremost by restoring God's holy order in the army. They became chivalrous, chivalrous again. Something they had lost with those women hanging around, and their blasphemy. And by doing so, she showed the real battle starts on the inside. Thus, the reason she was prayerful, she was pious, loving the Holy Mass, and frequently going to confession, even daily. She insisted that her soldiers go to confession and Mass frequently as well, and stop blaspheming God. Through such means, she raised the siege of Orléans in the length of a novena. It was a miracle, and everybody knew it. Thus, in all this, we see in Joan that the church prays and is holy. Prayer, truth, and virtue are her unfailing weapons and armor. St. Joan loved the priesthood, too, and the hierarchy. She always had a priest near at hand. On the way to lift the siege of Orléans, she had them lead in procession with a crucifix, chanting hymns. She had them handy to confess the dying, friend or foe. The supreme law of the church is the salvation of souls. Even in the darkest moments of her trial, never did she attack the person of her adversary, Bishop Pierre Cachon, or any of the priests, including cardinals, assisting him. She did, however, frequently warn the Bishop of Beauvais 
of the danger into which he had been placing his soul by conducting such a kangaroo court. She finally told him that it was through him that she was dying. And all the recorded notes is truly amazing. In all the recorded notes, and she has the most documented life there is. Everything is under sworn testimony. In all the recorded notes of the trial, not once was she disrespectful to such a despicable man. Yet she refused to submit to his evil plan, and she appealed to the Pope, which was her right. In this, she did well. She understood clearly that when authority was being abused, obedience was not required. The church loves the priesthood and will not work without her priests. In all this, she typified the hierarchical nature of the church as well as how to cope with abuses in authority. In her death, she was wrongly burned at the stake. There's no official sentence had been delivered in the civil department. Yet the executioner obeyed an illicit command of those in charge who said, carry out your duty. He should have said, well, then first pass the sentence. As she was consumed by the fire, she spoke the holy name of Jesus, looking at a crucifix with such fervor that nearly everyone, both friend and foe, wept alike. Friend and foe alike, they wept, walking away, striking their breasts. What is more, when the executioner came to dispose of the ashes, he found her heart unburned and still bleeding. That's all that was left. And here we see once again a type of how the church cannot be destroyed. She may seem to die, but she will live unto the end, pouring out her heart's blood for the salvation of man. Although there are many more points of contact we could consider, let's now turn to the connection of St. Joan to the church in our times and see the value of this great saint. First, we know that she was formed by the Archangel Michael at 13 years of age. She was given a share in his angelic spirituality, which is surely one of the reasons she maintained the course until the end. Yet this has happened again in the children of Fatima. They were formed while still very young by an archangel, the same one actually, to fight an even larger war that is still raging. Recall that St. Joan was fighting the Hundred Years' War. It was her arrival on the scene that enabled it to end. We have been informed that the devil himself asked and received permission from God in the sight and hearing of Pope Leo XIII to conduct a Hundred Years' War against the church. A special note is how Joan had to be injured along the way, taking an arrow just above the breast at Orléans. And a couple of other injuries she incurred at other places, also the king could be crowned. But the French, who favored the English cause, namely the Burgundians, with Bishop Cachon at their head, cried out in so many words, we will not have this king rule over us. Thus they were demonizing his general, calling her a witch. Does this sound familiar? That conviction led, led them to put Joan through a series of trials that ended in a cruel death in order to bring down the king. It was a passion. But instead, this led to the end of the war as she prophesied. The English left in 1453. I hope you see the significance because they will not allow Christ to be king. He will, we will not allow this man to rule over us. This new hundred years war between heaven and hell will only end by the church embracing a passion in which we're in now. Like Joan, she must be wounded and seemingly burned to death at the stake. The church cannot be done away with. Come what may, her heart will remain bleeding out blood and water such that she will rise up again victorious. Conversions will happen and an age of peace will ensue. In the most recent battle of this Hundred Years' War, this new one, we have seen synods after synods and groups of cardinals and bishops opposing each other. 
Among other things, we have seen attacks on sound and traditional doctrine in regard to the sacrament of marriage, the Eucharist, and outside of the church there is no salvation. Just as the council at Poitiers came down in favor of St. Joan the Maid, that she was truly Catholic, and nothing to the contrary could be found, that she was virginal. So too, we have had popes and bishops and councils defending the perennial teaching of the church and the meaning of holy matrimony. Just as Joan was again put on a trial a second time, this time under by another group of bishops and priests who favored the English cause, so too we have had recent synods of cardinals and bishops seeking to reverse the claims of the church's teaching and disciplines on many things like celibacy and marriage. So what was proven by the one seems to have been rejected by the other. A special note is this. The second trial of Joan, the one by Pierre Cachon, was mostly conducted in a legal manner at almost every single turn. Does this not sound familiar as it's happened again and again? I hope you see the significance of this saint for our times. St. Joan was blasphemed many times by the English, who constantly called her a harlot and a witch. This type has been fulfilled by the Protestants many times as they falsely claim the church to be the harlot of Babylon, mentioned in the Apocalypse that she works by the power of Satan, And yet they're gravely wrong. They're critically wrong. They're deceived. Instead, God shows the world why St. Joan and his church are loved by him by putting him on display in a passion. Just as St. Joan brought forth a king, so too will the church bring forth a great monarch prophesied to come by so many great saints. He will rise out of France, this monarch, have all doubts removed as to his legitimacy, and he will be crowned. Along with a great pope, he will restore God's order in the world and in the church, leading to the restoration of the social reign of Christ the King. Given this type, we can easily surmise that just as St. Joan of Arc enabled the crowning of King Charles VII to happen in a very short time, Miraculously, by all accounts, so too will the tides change quickly in the current crisis. Take heart. You're in the right place. Leaders today are just like the leaders back then. They refused to listen to heaven's plan, and so it is delayed. They're not listening to Fatima, just as they didn't listen to Joan. Those Christians fighting each other on French soil over the Hundred Years' War way back then caused the loss of Constantinople. Many of those fighting in this war, especially against Joan, had agreed to go on crusade, both against the Muslims and the heretics in Bohemia, the Utraquists. They never went. Is it by accident that Constantinople fell to the Muslims in the very same year the English were forced to leave France? 1453. There is surely more than one reason why the Muslims are rising up at this time. We're fighting each other instead of them. Furthermore, all during the trial of Joan, she and King Charles were called heretics, schismatics. Now for traditional-minded Catholics, this is a typical label placed upon us. We have been here before in Joan. But it is it by accident, but is it by accident that the English themselves fell into heresy and schism under the tyrannical King Henry VIII less than a century later over the indissolubility of holy matrimony? Isn't it ironic? Again, there is something special going on with St. Joan. During her lifetime, a poet wrote of her. It's Christine de Passant. She's actually kind of famous in certain circles. She wrote, Destroying the English is not her main concern. It is rather to ensure the survival of the faith. She wrote that in July 1429. There it is. The church seeks to preserve the faith, and the English were soon to lose it. In her life, St. Joan said she feared only treason, betrayal, cowardice, 
disloyalty. Those are the things she didn't like. It always takes a Judas to bring a passion upon the church and her saints. Bad Catholics. Joan was captured by a betrayal at Compiègne. She herself predicted what happened. And so the church has nothing to fear except betrayal of her own from within. Joan was not valued by her own, and so she was not ransomed. The enemy knew who Joan was, though. They valued her very much, spending enormous amounts of time and money to put her to death. What would they have done if only she had been on their side? And so it is with the church. Her importance and power is often more appreciated by her enemies than by her own. She's not loved by her own. Just as Joan was allowed to be captured and put on trial without any offering of assistance, so too it seems few care about the plight of the church today. May we not be numbered among these poor, unloving, and unfeeling souls. And finally, we might note that many stories and plays about Joan's life ended by having her die in some manner other than burning at the stake. This shows how hard it is for man to accept the passion of the church. God's ways are not man's ways. He wants to put his love on display. How edifying it is for us in our present trial to look upon the life of St. Joan of Arc. Would that we might become such a source of edification for those who will come after us someday. That they too might look back at this dress rehearsal for the end of ends and grow in faith, hope, and charity because of what we did and are doing. But let us end this evening with this very important point of hope for our present crisis. In the official statement referring to Joan's rehabilitation under Pope Callistics III in 1456, after considering all the collected data in toto, we find these edifying words in regards to the trial, the judgments, and the final demise of St. Joan, which surely typify a future truly Catholic council that will rule definitively on what we have been passing through over the last few decades. The same council, the same ruling of Calistus III demanded that a cross be placed where she died to show that someone holy and good had died there, not a witch. Here is what they said. We declare that on certain points of the truth of Joan's confessions have been passed over in silence, that on other points her confessions have been falsely translated, a double unfaithfulness, We declare that even the form of certain words has been altered in such manner as to change the substance of their meaning. We can think now of mercy, love, marriage, spouse, natural law. The substance of these words have been toyed with. For the which, they went on, these same articles as falsely, calumniously, and deceitfully extracted, and as contrary even to the confessions of the accused, we break... We annihilate and annul, and we ordain by this present judgment that they be torn up. We say, we pronounce, we decree, we declare the said processes and sentences are full of cousinage, that's trickery and deceit, full of iniquity in consequences and manifest errors, in fact, as well as in law. We say that they have been, are, and shall be null, non-existent, without value or effect. We break them, we annihilate them, we annul them and declare them void of effect. And we declare that the said Jeanne and her relatives have not on account of the said trial of Pierre Cachon contracted nor incurred any mark or stigma of infamy. We declare them quit and purged of all the consequences of these same processes. Amazing. St. Joan died on May 30th, 1431. St. Joan of Arc, deliverer of France, maid of Orléans, pray for us. Intercede for our deliverance from captivity of modernism and all its effects at the end of this 100 years' war.